need for making mobile telecommunications resilient and the realisation that our ordinary kind of carrier approach is actually like completely unresilient. It's, actually, it's really fragile. It's dependent on towers, it's dependent on long range links um, and you know phone calls in this room probably go via Sydney and all of these sorts of, uh, of difficulties. Um, and so we set about making software that enables voice calls, um, SMS, or we call it MeshMS, uh, it's our mesh version, uh, and uh, file exchange over our rhizome store and forward uh, system to be really resilient forms of communication. And one of the key things is that you can uh, collect you know, a file or a message for someone and the phones will replicate it uh, like Usenet and eventually it'll get copied onto the right device and then that device will go, bing, oh look, you've got a new message. Uh, so it's that kind of uh, resilient uh, approach. So what these slides are from, uh, so uh, about 11 months ago, uh, we went over uh, the invitation of New Zealand Red Cross uh, to work with them on what they're calling succinct data, uh, which is applying these kinds of mesh communications uh, approaches uh, with low bandwidth satellite SMS modules. So actually I should have brought the, the thing with us. You can get uh, like a... It's a hand sized thing that will uh, do uh, SMS over the Iridium uh, constellation. Um, the really funny thing is, you know how like the, the standard list price for a SMS over a regular carrier network is what, about 25 cents a message? Um, over the Iridium network it's about 25 cents a message. Um, but you, you get 8 bit bytes. <laughs> Um, so in fact, you're actually getting better value um, <laughs> out of you know, a, uh, an incredibly uncost effective satellite constellation as we can out of our domestic uh, carriers. Um, SMS is more expensive than sending data to the Voyager program. Yes, that's right. Yeah, SMS per megabyte. So say if we had 32 megabytes of data here that we needed to get to London, um, would it be cheaper, A, to send it all via um, SMS at the list price via Telstra, or would it be cheaper, B, to book a suite on an A380 in both directions and carry it on a memory stick? Uh, the answer is, of course, B. Um, so if anyone has some data they need to move to the UK, um, please uh, let me know. Um, and I, and I think we can do it for it, it, it's only about $30,000 or something for a return suite uh, like that. But you know, you, you'll be saving a good $45,000 or so compared to, uh, to SMS. Um, but so back in the land of, uh, uh, of more uh, serious and sensible, so they wanted to be able to keep track of teams uh, when they're out and about in the field and to be able to coordinate their activity uh, in more effective ways and also to be able to collect data from in the field. So they, uh, the longer term goal, and we'll talk about this a little bit more because we're actually going to head off with them again in about a month and hopefully we'll have our software finished that we need for it. Um, is to actually be able to go out and collect field reports that might be, you know, family has, you know, three adults, five kids, uh, nine goats, and they need you know, a whole pile of stuff, but obviously they don't need milk or cheese. Um, and just, you know, collecting this kind of information that then comes back and then they can coordinate and go, okay, we need to order in, you know, uh, 400,000 blankets and a whole pile of wheat bix to use the goat milk. Um, so it's thinking, of, you know, it really is, it's providing, uh, I would call it situation awareness, really. And so, uh, last year what we did with the early version of the serval mesh, which uh, I'm quite happy to admit was uh, largely cobbled together and, you know, and tied up with duct tape and, um, uh, and bailing twine. Uh, in fact, we actually on, the, on the, uh, the Android phones we had a complete installation of asterisk. That was an example of just how uh, quickly cobbled together a solution. So the, you know, the APK was like 6 meg and installed into like 25 megabytes or something as it extracted this whole thing. Uh, if you want to ask about porting asterisk to Android, it's a very entertaining process. Um, but back at the point. Um, so we had this early system and we proved that, you know, yes, in fact, uh, we could do it. And it was really interesting. By the, the end of the week, uh, we had some of the... Cause the so KiwiX itself uh, is the IT and telecommunications emergency response unit in New Zealand, which is one of five globally, uh, only five. Um, who are called in to provide telecoms support for other Red Cross units when they deploy. And so uh, the, um, uh, Matthew Lloyd, who runs that team, likes every year to get them out on a, a field exercise and as closely as possible simulate uh, real field environments. So they're made to pass through um, slightly fictitious uh, passport controls and actually, you know, they're actually asked to actually bring their real passports with them and they get their papers checked and of course they're bringing in crazy high powered radio gear and so they have to have all the, the import papers for that and they go through all of that process um, 
and then you know they, they're doing the things they need to do. Uh, they get harassed by uh, militia. Um, of course, it's probably really not quite kosher for uh, you know, those of us on the disruption teams to actually turn up with AK-47s and uh, the real militia toys. Um, it's much more fun actually. Uh, so last year we uh, had a, a rather OHS obsessed. Um, militia who basically you know, came around and you know, were reading out the customer service agreements and uh, detaining them with, uh, with endless uh, telemarketing style uh, paperwork, <laughs> um, which was equally effective. It was actually really fun because we, um, we'd pre-arranged with one of the guys. We actually we gave him a, um, um, basically a, a gold membership card uh, for the, like, the, uh, the militia, sort of you know, Terry Pratchett style of, you know, if, if you're a member of the guild then you get treated better and all of these sorts of things. And so you know, we, we're going through this thing and we had the, the three cars in a row uh, uh, all lined up there. And so, you know, we're doing the spiel to each one in each car saying, you know, if you have a, you know, if any of you are members with the, uh, the Militia Guild, to, you know, to please present your cards now. And, you know, the, the first couple of cars is kind of like, you know, whatever, you know, and the, and, and, and the sniggers. And then we sort of get to the back car. And then, unbeknownst to the other three guys in the car, this guy says, oh, no, no, yep, I've got mine with me. And they're like, oh, excellent, you know, oh, platinum member, sir, fantastic. Like, just, you know, if you could just pull your vehicle out and uh, proceed down to the front of the queue. <laughs> And then you know, they all get to get, got to hop out and go to a refreshment centre and you know, got happily refreshed while you know, we largely ransacked their car and decided what few things to pinch. Uh, but I think they actually came out in front and actually I think those guys actually didn't give our pens back either on signing the paperwork. We actually, we actually we had receipts when we kind of like took their gear um, to sort of add to the uh, the paperwork. Um, but so you know, we, we sort of have these disruptions and things to uh, uh, to try and simulate just the, the real delays because they had the missions to achieve in set time frames. So as lighthearted as some of this was, it was about uh, you know doing what they needed to do uh, in a day. Um, so we'll just go through what Matthew has provided. Here. So some of this is things that I think we'll be quite familiar with, and this is really from a, a Red Cross to other agency uh, perspective. So you know, smartphones they can do a whole pile of stuff. But without a network, uh, they're pretty useless. Uh, so, you know, obviously, we're looking at uh, you know, alternatives. So we're using uh, our mesh phones uh, with Wi-Fi-based mesh. And I'm not. Oh, okay. Oh, we have an animated one. Um, so we have phones that can uh, mesh together. We can bring in another phone. We can mesh those together. Bring another phone. Um, and maybe this one's out of range. So then. We can put some kind of booster device, as a mesh potato that uh, David Rowe will be uh, quite familiar with. Um, and then we can use, say, the several mapping tool. And so the, the, uh, the blue point um, would be yourself, the red points are other people. And this was uh, OpenStreetMaps, curiously enough, didn't actually have a, a great deal of detail about uh, the middle of a pine forest in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> And so the, uh, it's presumably the correct name of the place. Uh, and so the yellow point would actually be a, a point of interest. So you might be marking that you know, a road is out or that there's people that need assistance. Um, and we can then uh, add in other fascinating ways so the, uh, the mesh can synchronise to things uh, as they pass by. I mean, a little bit uh, uh, facetious with the bike, but actually totally feasible because the software automatically synchronises data onto devices. And this was part of what we were prototyping. And I remember uh, sitting in the, because uh, we got to uh, be part of the, uh, the staff, we got to stay in these lovely cottages over here. Uh, meanwhile, everyone else stayed about a kilometre away uh, on some grass. Um, <laughs> so it's good to be in the organisation of these things rather than in there. And this is actually their HF radio masts. And the, the first thing to be set up was the satellite dish for internet. Um, so the uh, IT&T uh, guys are, uh, are very much of like-mindedness to ourselves, I suspect. Um, but so I remember sitting in the accommodation there and hearing the convoy coming back in at the end of the day and thinking, oh, I better go and take my phone and synchronise to get the data off of their phone onto mine so that we could actually upload uh, to our map display to show where everyone had been. Um, and we had this up on the internet so that uh, observers outside could see what was going on as well. And so I thought, oh, I better go and do that. And I thought, oh, I'll just do one last copy off of my phone. I'm like, oh, oh no, it's all right. They drove within Wi-Fi range. It had automatically synchronised onto my phone. Um, and I just pushed it straight up. I didn't have to get out of my seat to do it. And it was just, there was moments like that that were uh, just tremendous. And because what we had, is that the software was very early at the time and we were integrating with two other companies kind of stuff as well. Um, we were the only uh, open source group. Um, and so I think we had nine software updates or something. Jeremy can probably remember the, uh, the craziness of that week. It was just, you know, they'd do some fixes or whatever, and then I'd, I'd be back on the satellite phone, uh, back to base saying, oh, 
oh yes, and, and this isn't working now, and we need this, and they've done this, and they haven't done that, and we need to make this work. Um, and so we were pushing out software updates. Um, the best way to get software updates out in that setting was actually over the mesh itself. So we are actually using our rhizome store and forward mechanism, uh, pushing out updates. Um, I'd go and meet with the team leaders in the operations centre, and we, kind of, we, we told them on the first day, look, whenever you come in, bring your phones in with the mesh running, and I'll have my phone with the mesh running, and by the time we've gone through all of the stuff, um, your phones will actually have the software and whatever updates uh, you need, and I'll, that will have copied all the data that I need uh, back off of those phones. Um, so they did that, and then they go back to their teams, it would synchronise onto their teams by the time they'd explain to them, hey, you need to put this software update on, and then it stops this crash, or it adds this feature. Um, and so it was, uh, for all of the, the faults that it had in the very early software, it was, it was just compelling in what it was able to do. And by sort of the, the fourth or fifth day of the, uh, the week, uh, we had a, a couple of guys saying, oh, have you, have you got the requisition forms on the mesh yet? We're sick and tired of filling out the paper ones. Um, and it was just, it was a really pleasing moment that, I mean, they'll be really tolerant with the, uh, the very early versions of the software that we were using. But it was still um, utile enough and they could see the potential enough that they could see moving uh, a bunch of things across onto the mesh. And indeed, this year, uh, we're hoping that if we get everything sorted, actually, that they will be doing their logistics requests um, via the mesh so that the, the guy operating the logistics bus uh, with all the gear in it uh, will actually get their orders before they turn up and uh, it will actually be of, uh, uh, of great operational use. Uh, so, again, this is just from more of Matthew's slides. So this is the, uh, the little... SMS satellite modules, um, and so yeah, we're using the uh, the live tracking from that uh, as well. Cause we're kind of we're trying out a, a whole pile of things at the same time uh, with this. Uh, yes, and so the we we'll, uh, we'll compare the inReach to an Android phone by Bluetooth, and we'd written uh, software to interface that so that we could push the message traffic uh, back and forth. And then, of course, InReach had their own uh, fun stuff. This is obviously uh, not in the middle of the forest. Uh, it hasn't been subdivided yet, which is uh, uh, fairly fortunate. So where did, you, where did this thing happen? Uh, where did it happen? Uh, so, oh, goodness me. Now you're going to, to test my memory of Kiwi place names. Um, was, it, uh, was it inland from Wanganui Bay, I think? Sorry? You can tell by the bend in the track. Yeah. Oh, no, no, the bend. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. I know that track well. Yeah, that's right. No, the, the, the bigger photo, the, the bigger map that you had. Yes. Down one. Yeah. So, and New Zealand's a really small place. That's right. So, so for those of us that haven't been there, so uh, North Island, bottom of the North Island, you've got uh, Wellington, the capital, and it's slightly northwest, sort of... Um, yeah, we're about I don't know, 20 or 30 k's inland. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, and, covering, um, and covering a range of about 150 kilometres from top to bottom. Um, so for all that the Wi-Fi range on these is only a couple of hundred metres, um, the fact that the mesh stores and forwards the data uh, meant that we're actually able to get useful data. And so we got something like it was 110,000 telemetry points off of the, uh, the teams. Um, and actually tracking your staff on deployment is actually really, really, really important for these organisations because they need to make sure that their people remain safe uh, and can be tracked. And that also actually reduces the risk of bad things happening to them if the local militia and all the rest of it um, that are armed with more than paperwork um, actually know that they're actually being actively tracked and uh, it's going to be harder for them to, uh, uh, to do naughty things. So um, is that the range of the mesh network? Uh, so the, the mesh is, yeah, it's Wi-Fi range, so yeah. in, in open country, one to two hundred metres between each hop of phones. But of course, as the phones move closer to other phones, and they come in range and it synchronises, so uh, quite like using it. Sorry? Yeah, so the Kiwi pronunciation is... is it the, that's, the, that's the current... Official pronunciation. <laughs> yes. But I vaguely recall being assured that it's definitely not Wanganui, which would be the, uh, the otherwise standard Australian pronunciation for that spelling. <laughs> but it was fun. Cause we had, uh, do we have any of our um, American friends here in the room with us? Excellent. Cause we had some Americans there, and so there was some uh, friendly rivalry between the two hemispheres. Um, as opposed to the vicious <laughs> rivalry between the Australians and the New Zealanders. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> one just needs one just needs to be relaxed as an Australian in New Zealand and just remember, you know, when they ask where you're from, you just say I'm from the West Island, and it's all totally, totally fine. Yes. Um, so Kestrel were providing uh, some structured form. Uh, systems uh, for the, uh, the, the thing as well. So this was again getting pushed over the inReach and so uh, this technology, we'd always planned for this functionality to be in the serval mesh so we're combining a thing called the Art Open Data um, Kit, ODK, um, that lets you fill in structured forms by uh, XML and then we can either backhaul by um, Wi-Fi or hopefully it will come in and show that we can go via the mesh uh, yep. and then uh, Yes, potentially by inReach as well. So we can kind of, if we take all the XML out of an XML document, you're left with you know, like about eight bytes out of the typical megabyte of XML. Um, that's called the actual information. Yes, that's right. Um, and so you know, we can entropy code that typically down to about two bits um, and then uh, feed that across in a, a fairly efficient way. And so we're looking at doing much the same uh, this time around uh, for KiwiX. So. Have you tried to use it? Some actual disasters in Australia and New Zealand, like fires or no, earthquake. Yeah, so we, um, so we haven't actually used it in any um, you know, in earnest deployment yet. Uh, we still feel that we need to do more work to mature it to that point. Whereas uh, the trial exercise, it's with you know, it's highly IT savvy people using it, um, and who are actually like they know that we're actually doing testing as well on it. That um, you know, they expect that there will be issues, and so. For us, they get to, they show us what the needs are that they actually have, and that really helps us to knock the, the corner, like any kind of user testing. And so it's uh, it's tremendously valuable uh, user testing from our perspective. Um, so uh, we've kind of been through this. One interesting thing, of course, that the, the cost is actually much, much, much cheaper for um, these organisations. So they're all kind of moving from HF analog radio and VHF and UHF handsets um, to digital packet radio, which incidentally a lot of people. Um, that uh, are older and actually know that uh, the limitations of both analog and digital um, aren't that thrilled about. Uh, but you know, fifty dollar phone versus eight hundred dollar handset. It's you know, there's some compelling arguments to be made, particularly if we can supplement it with longer range communications uh, with these with the, the mesh helper device concept that we've talked about earlier in the day. Yes. Yeah, so it, it, it's safer because the handsets don't look odd. It also, it turns out that these are really easy to get through any airport. Um, so one of the one of the things that um, is it, the, the number of phones I think my record of phones carried on my person through an airport is eleven. <laughs> um, and, and so that's on that occasion. The, the other record for the strangest phone hardware carried through an airport and worn into an airplane uh, on the way to the US and my dad post 9/11 was actually wearing my shoe phone. Um, <laughs> Which was, was like I, I checked with airport security and everything first to make sure it wouldn't be a problem, and but I was surprised at how totally not a problem there was, uh, given that the bottom plate of the shoe was held on like with a large sharp screw, and it was just kind of. It wasn't a drink in a bottle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> indeed, so indeed. What was, for, um, uh, what, what was the shoe phone for? Um, largely, it was because I could. Um, I, I, I actually I made it for a church camp. Um, so there's a church, uh, Christian Endeavour camp that's held every year uh, in the hills back from Adelaide and if they typically have kind of movie related themes because uh, it's sort of a teenager to uh, early 20s and so this particular year they said oh, look, let's have a, a get smart uh, kind of theme and they said you're an engineer, <laughs> we'd like a shoe phone, a cone of silence um, and a phone box and I'm like yeah, okay, I, I think I can do that. Every parent wants a cone of silence. Yeah, but the, the, the really interesting thing, the cone of silence, like when you actually make a real one, it works just as well as the one <laughs> in the show. Like, I, I actually, I, I now believe that all the, the jokes around the, the cone of silence are actually from when they actually tried it out and actually realised that, like, the acoustics are fascinating when you have that kind of double dumbbell shape. Everyone outside can, in fact, hear you and you can't hear each other. <laughs> It really does work as advertised. Um, and a 19 inch rack with a glass door and a, a bit of sticky tape and a, a cheap plastic uh, payphone actually works fantastically as a, uh, a phone. Uh, but and, and the, the, the campus had a fantastic time. Uh, no, that's right, it weighs more than seven kilos. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly hard to get up into the, uh, the overhead lockers. Um, 
but yeah, and, and the kids loved it because they kind of had to do all these challenges, and then they basically got to use the shoe phone to ring control to report who the agents were and stuff. It was yeah, good fun. Yes, I, I was surprised. I thought that someone would have made a shoe phone that actually worked prior to that, but no one actually had made a, a proper wearable one. The closest one is a, um, a, a basketball player in the US who has like size 89 shoes who just basically like just you know chiseled out a canoe size hole and put a uh, um, some large mobile phone in there. That's right, but then he proceeded to break it because when you need size 93 shoes, like you can't actually take any of it out without them breaking. Um, so I'm not sure whether we have pictures in here otherwise. How many, have I used all my time or do we have? Um, well, yes, yeah, so if people want to ask questions, and I'll see if I can find the pretty photos to show at the same time. Could you maybe give an example or two of things that you've learned from the networking experience in the field and that you've been the project? Sure. So, um, one of the things we found actually was when you put 20 mesh phones into a room, um, that they could actually get quite chatty. They're worse than ducks. You know, like if, you, if you have ducks separately, they don't quack. You put ducks together and they, they, they quack. Um, so mesh phones kind of behave the same. Um, but also what we discovered actually was that the, the Red Cross, actually, they, they didn't care about voice. Um, they didn't care about the, the immediate real-time communications. What they cared about was this succinct data content of small pieces of information um, that could actually be used to inform what they're doing. Um, and even, I mean, you know, the, the, the battery life uh, was fairly dreadful and is still suboptimal. Um, that's reasonably manageable for them. Um, but yeah, it was this, this realisation that the store and forward um, and structured form entry really were the, uh, the valuable things and combining the local mesh um, to get large data through quickly and cheaply with the satellite for when uh, there's no other option available. And it was, yeah, that combination uh, really made for a... Um, quite a, a compelling solution, I think. And so we have a great deal of excitement from uh, our partner uh, in New Zealand, Red Cross, who is this man here, uh, Matthew Lloyd. Um, and so this is a chap from Kestrel and uh, a bunch of the other guys there. Um, so that was setting up the... And, and feel free to ask questions while I just flip through pretty pictures. Yes? Uh, did any of the synthetic militia know about the civil project and have uh, try and do any like DOS attacks on the uh, no, uh, I, I, to be quite honest, for the early versions of the software, there was no need to actually arrange DOS attacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a built-in feature in the early versions. It's not, it's not a bug. That's right, but we, we've taken that out. Let's reduce the APK size by about 4 meg. <laughs> yeah. so, so I can imagine out in the field that these Red Cross teams might be quite few and very far between. Um, so, so realistically, what sort of range or you know, how, how, how can that be dealt with? Yeah, so this is really why we're using those satellite SMS modules. So you'd have a team who would be within Wi-Fi range of each other um, and of their vehicle. Uh, and sort of the, the longer term vision we have is actually something on the vehicle which is probably with a, a decent plus 3B or plus 6DB Wi-Fi antenna instead of some of these phones that have, depending on the orientation, up to about minus 10DB, we believe, possibly even worse. Um, so, and one of the fascinating things, like Wi-Fi here in this room actually has pretty poor range. Um, you get out into the open country and there's no microwave ovens, there's not 800 other delegates uh, all trying to check their Gmail at the same time. Um, and just, you know, all of that kind of thing disappears. And so uh, we found range between phones can be like two to 300 metres uh, in the open. So particularly we went up to, to Arkarula in the, uh, this, out back in South Australia. And you know, it was pretty much ideal for Wi-Fi. Like you're talking about, you know, like six percent humidity or something. There's no vegetation. We're on ridge top A. Someone else is on ridge top B. You've got you know Fresnel zones and clear horizons, and it, it was all lovely. And we're getting yeah around 300, I think, because we're using G1 phones, and I think they actually have better Wi-Fi antenna. Because I reckon a couple of the links we had were nearer 500 meters. Great. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure.